the church. There's an awesome work of God that's taking place in people's lives. And once again, I must reiterate <coughs> that pastors and churches must never fall into the entrapment of using the matrix of numbers to measure success. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Because if that be the case, Noah failed terribly. After all those decades of preaching, you only got eight people saved. So I'd say as an evangelist, he's, he's flunked. One on one. Did get anybody saved? We look at Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't have any influence there. Zero. Uh, if we look at so many, even in the New Testament, Jesus himself died alone on the cross. Even his own disciples that handed him and ran like rats off a sinking ship. One of them was a devil. I mean, listen, measure success by numbers, Jesus was a failure. And, and the list goes on. Here at Calvary Community Church, we know better. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We have one that's not Presbyterian. Because I cannot hear your head. No, not. Anyways, now, we measure success here by two things. Number one, by the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. So it's written in our mission statement, striving for competence in a Christian walk of wisdom till Christ. So we measure success as a ministry by the matrix of transformative work of God in your heart and life. How many feel that you're different today than you were when you first came here to Calvary to Amen. Is your life different? Do you look at life differently? Can you see change in your life since you've been in Calvary Community Church? Amen. Yeah. Secondly, we measure success at Calvary Community Church by our striving to please God in all of our ways. The Bible's two things here I want to say about pleasing God. Number one, Jesus said, I know that my Father hears me because I do always those things that are pleasing in His sight. Take that as a matrix, measuring the system. When your life pleases God, the Bible says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Amen. Amen. That's right. Now, it doesn't say that his enemies are going to agree with you. But that your, your enemies will, like lions, have their mouths shut. And they're going to be proven to be the idiot in the matter. So in other words, no weapon formed against yourself. So the point is, that's how here at Calvary Community we can tell that God is moving, softened by, by His Spirit, and that we are on a plane, on a path of success in our church. Plus, you know that the favor of God is with you when you're breaking all records after 18 years of ministry. Last year we received record receipts for the year of 2017. Record receipts last year. Record. And we received and, and gave in missions record amount last year. So what is that? That says that God's favor is upon us. Amen. 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 That's right. That means that our hearts are open because our pocketbooks are open. Our checkbooks are open. And we're willing to sacrifice, we're willing to give. We're willing to see the business of God, God's business. We're looking to see and to participate. Jesus said at the age of 12, I must be about my father's business. And when you're about God's business and doing God's business, God will take care of your business. Amen. Take care of God's business and God will take care of your business. That's all there is to it. I'd rather have God's favor than the honor of any person in the world, Amen. including Amen. the rich.
riches, kings and sheiks all over, you know, the Arab world and the present United States. And quite frankly, as far as Trudeau up in Canada is concerned, if I never get to see the man or get to know him personally, I don't feel like I've lost anything at all. None. In fact, I probably I'm better off. Maybe he's better off than he doesn't mean me then. So I would like to say tonight that to have God smile on your life has to be the greatest sense of gratification. Amen. When you were a child, was it not that moment when your dad said to you, I'm proud of you, son, or daughter, was not at that moment that it gave you a great sense. If he asked you to do something, and you did a good job to the best of your ability, and he looked at it and said, wow, what a great job. A pat on the back from someone that you esteem highest in your life. Amen. Amen. A, an embrace of validation from your father. Mm -hmm. how, how valuable is that? An embrace of validation from our Heavenly Father. Jesus said, if I receive the honor from men, I receive nothing. But if I receive honor from my Father, then it's truly our life. Mm -hmm. And so, that's why it's important to live in that vein of thought, in that lifestyle, always pleasing God in everything you do, even if it means sacrifice. And tonight, I'm going to do my best to bring you into a new dimension I'm going to help you tonight to discover a new depth of your priesthood as, as a believer. And I want you to go to John 17 again. And we are going to look <coughs> at verse beginning tonight. At verse 21. Remember we're dealing with the things that Jesus prayed for? Mm -hmm. On Wednesday nights, what Jesus prayed for? Because... Mm -hmm. You often wonder, what should I pray for? What should I pray about? All you got to do is go straight to John 17 and look at the things that I've, I've already enumerated them. I've already told you all of them. Verse 1 all the way down to verse 20 and 21 now. I've already told you. I, I, I laid them out for you. And now we're getting to a place that, watch now, tonight we're going to look at something that's going to you're not, watch now, you're not just going to pray as it says in verse 20 and other verses prior, pray for those that are not in God yet but will be because of your testimony. We're not just praying for sinners to be saved now. Now we're looking at verse 21 on a way to bring them to the knowledge of God's saving grace. Alright? Look at that verse 21. That they all may be one. Now, you might look at that and say, Father, that is a tall order. What parent in the house would wish for their kids to get along? Does anybody have a house full of kids that everyone gets along? Mm -hmm. Does anybody have you? <laughs> Some of you have only one kid, and he doesn't get along with himself. <laughs> And so it's hard. And now when you get two and a half, three billion people, not to mention the ones that have come and gone already, that they may be one. Is this a prayer maybe that's out of the realm of reality? No. no. Is this a prayer that is wishful thinking? No. no. Are you like me? I don't want to pray for something that is wishful thinking. I don't, I don't want to pray. In fact, Jesus taught us not to pray. I mean, if I had a prayer, I'd like to be as tall as Gary. And as much hair and thick hair, not like Charlie, but as Gary has. I love your head. You shine, brother. You have a beautiful dome, a beautiful dome, a gold dome on the rock here sitting out there right there. But I'd like to have thick as hair and his height. But Jesus said, if you were to pray to add one cubic to your height, it's not going to be answered. It's wishful thinking. Some of you have been praying about losing weight. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> it's possible, but how do you know with that prayer, it requires discipline. Mm -hmm. And so don't pray to lose weight, pray for discipline. 
Amen. Well, just as little get you that last way. <laughs> Some of us have a prayer to eat the right foods. Don't pray, don't pray for personal discipline. Discipline, personal discipline will get you anything you want. Is that, is that correct? Okay. I've had so many people over the years ask me to pray about things that I know if I pray for, I know it's not going to happen. Because I'm not asking God in my prayer, nor is that person asking me to join with them in the right thing. Like, for instance, either uh, eating the right food, losing weight, whatever the case might be. You know, I wish I was talking about it. All these kind of things. So Jesus tells him, don't pray for things that are in a wishful thinking dimension. Don't go there. You're wasting your energy because God is not going to answer that prayer. Just, by the way, what can I not do that he can't do? I mean, what can he do that I can't? He's taller than me. But what he can do, what that I can't do? Well, I'm not at my age right now because I have a bulge disc in my back and he does it. <coughs> but if we were 25, 30 years younger, I don't think there's anything you'd be able to do that I can't, other than being able to reach in the cupboards. I, I, yeah, yeah. But then I can fit in small cars better than you can. So anyways, <laughs> there, you know, there's advantage of being short by the day. Is that right? That's right. There's advantages of being tall. So in other words, so why, why pray for things that are wishful thinking? So Jesus says here to us, and he's praying to the Father in his priestly prayer that his disciples would be one. As you, Father, and I are one, because now he's not just, watch now, he's not just asking the Father to create unity, divine unity within the body of Christ, within the disciples. He's actually giving an illustration. He's actually giving a picture of what that looks like with God. As the Father and the Son are one. So now we have a goal. Now we have an image. So I want to help you tonight to instruct you to go to find deeper depths in your priesthood. That will bring you into areas of your life and your spiritual walk with God that you've never been before. I've had so many people over the years tell me that they're praying for this, that, and the other thing. And the first thing that comes to my mind, first, let me give you one of the things that people have asked me to pray about. Oh, Pastor Bell, please pray for us at our church that God will send revival. Please pray for revival in America. Well, my mom and dad been doing that, my grandparents before them, praying for a revival in Canada. I mean, and so here, here, here's the thing. Whatever you ask your pastor to pray for, I would tell you the same thing I told these other preachers when they're asking me to pray for revival to hit their church. I said to them, define for me what revival is. Then I'll pray for it. What's revival? What is your opinion about what revival is? Well, you, you know, just revival. You know, <coughs> no, define it. Describe it. Line it out per line. All right? Just define it for me revival. You know what? They couldn't define revival. You're asking me to pray for God to give you revival, and you can't even define it. So that man tells me that if revival did hit, you wouldn't know. <laughs> Is that right? Is that correct? Because if you can't define it, how will you know if your prayer has been answered? <laughs> and they stand there dumbfounded. The Define for me what you're asking me to pray about and to agree with you in revival. Just, I have, you know, on my text in the phone, I have other ones that say, Pastor, pray for, for me. I need a spiritual refreshing. That is such a, a broad brush request, so generalized. I don't know what to pray for. A refreshing, is that a cruise? Seven day, ten day cruise, or is that, is that, what does it mean? Not for a lot of people that way, but that's not spiritual refreshing. 
then that's just running where we stress. And, and so, what is it? Define spiritual refreshing. If you can define it for me, I can better pray for you. I'm in a better state on how to pray. What is it that you're asking for? Are you getting the picture today? Are you getting the picture of what I'm saying tonight? Here's your refreshing. Right yes. there. Yes. So, yes, so we can have the word of God cleansing us and so forth. But So Jesus told us as priests, as believers, showing us an example that we should pray for unity. Amen. Right? right. But he's also defining it for us. Yeah. He's giving us a mental picture of what unity is. What does it look like? Somebody tell me quick. It's right there in the second line. Christ and the Lord. Christ and the Father as one. Just as they are one. Let me ask you a question. Watch this now. To define the unity between God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, all three, to define that unity, the best way to do that is to what will this world and universe look like if they had disagreed? Talk to me, somebody. Just what does it look like? What would it look like? Chaos. 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 Are you getting the picture? So what are we saying here? We if you don't know how to define God the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, unity, try to define it by what it would be if they weren't unified. Amen. Right. Is this good? Yes. Are you getting a clear picture? Can I, I submit to you tonight, there'd be no universe. Right. Man would not exist. Right. Let us make man in our image. Is that correct? Yes. yes. In the Garden of Eden, let us, sixth day of creation, let us make man in our image. You and I would not exist. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me listen. You ready for this? What if your body, listen, what happens to a human being when their body, soul, and spirit are disunified? There isn't anything. What happens to them? They're dead. Not necessarily. I said disunified, not uh, absent. If the spirit leads you then. No. Inside, what happens? When the soul and the spirit disagree. Depression. Now we're talking. Are you getting this now? Can you imagine? All three suffer. All three suffer. Your soul is in agony. Your spirit is tormented. Your body, yeah. even its joints, yeah. are suffering. The conscience is out to lunch. So that you become totally dysfunctional in life. So what does that tell you about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? They are perfectly aligned in purpose. You see, how, how, didn't Paul say at one point, he said, my spirit wants to do one thing, but my old nature wants to do something else. Chapter 7 of Romans, and I don't know, I'm torn. But he said, I've learned to keep my body hupo. H-U-P-O in the Greek means under subjection to my spirit. Are you getting this? So Christ is telling us in this prayer, you see, there'd be no universe if God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were not in agreement, if they were not synchronized, if they were not in alignment, Natalie. There'd be no universe, there'd be no stars. There would be no galaxy, there'd be no God. And certainly, There'd be no beauty. Can you shout amen? amen? Amen. Beauty would be non-existent in this world if God was in disagreement with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Think of this world in the absence of God. Now, 
that's how you can define triunity. Triunity is the, 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 the triunity is three in one. Triunity is three in one of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If you can't define their unity, how can you pray for it? Amen. And Paul tells us what in Corinthians about the body of Christ in the Corinthians. And he also told in Colossians, and the, Galatians, and the Colossians particularly, he said if you constantly are backbiting each other, devouring each other, you'll destroy the whole body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So he's telling the Corinthian church, I want to say it's chapter 8 or 9 of 1 Corinthians, he says, don't you know that you're one body? And if one member of your body hurts, then the whole body suffers. That's called unity. If people in the church who are hurting don't matter to those who aren't, mm -hmm. how many know that that is not the body of Christ? That's not that's that's dysfunctional right there. Mm -hmm. right. If there's no compassion, sometimes things that exist that are difficult to define are better defined when you think of what the consequence would be if they were not united, as we're describing tonight. So I'm trying to show you a, get to a, a pathway to discover it to a deeper understanding and meaning of what your priestly prayer can be for your personal life, your home and marriage, and for your church. Amen. I, I tell you what, I, I've told you this before. I, 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 for years, I've been living here. We've been here, seven, how many years? 25, 24, 25 years. 20, about 25 years this year. 18, in remark, 18 in March, 25 years that we've been here in this area of Columbia. And over those years, I have attended, I don't know how many pastors' prayer meetings. And they kept saying, pray for unity among the churches. Pray for unity in the churches. Pray for unity among the pastors. Pray for unity. Over and over and over and over again. Year after year after year. Month after month after month. And I never saw any appreciable evidence of that prayer <coughs> being answered. And I asked that question. To some of these guys who were crying out for unity and praying for unity, I said, will you please help me? Can you define unity among the churches? Can you please define that? What does that look like? If you can define it, I can better pray for it. Because if I can define it, I can actually work toward it. Amen. <laughs> I can actually work toward it if I can define it. But if I can't define it, I can't apply myself to make it happen. To apply myself. And you know what? They are always baffled every time. They, don't, they can't define unity among the churches. I mean, I have my own version of what that looks like. But if you want to know, call me at the office. We'll sit down and have coffee and I'll explain it to you. Till then, it's my information to have and yours to look for. <laughs> so he's saying... That they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. All right. Here's the other piece of the puzzle. As Jesus is in God, God in Jesus, the other piece of the puzzle is you. Amen. In the Father and the Son. Amen. You in the Father and the Son. Are you getting that? So to define unity among ourselves, we should all have the same goal. Amen. People are unified when there's an objective. Help me, help me out, somebody help me. I can hear your head move now. There'll be unity when we're all striving for the same thing. Amen. 
Isn't that called teamwork? Yes. When you're either on the job and you have a staff? What if at the airport, the air traffic control disagreed with the pilot? That what would happen? Mm -hmm. It's a mess. Huh? It would be a mess. A big mess. Probably two planes <coughs> colliding to each other. There'd be crashes everywhere. Yeah. If, if the pilots say we're rebellious, well, I don't want to land over there. I want to go over there. Well, I'll go find somewhere and when I find it, I'll let you know. Can you imagine the air collisions? If somebody went off on a tangent somewhere? Can you see that happens in churches? There are collisions in the church. Hello? There are collisions in churches because people are off on their own individual agenda yes. and tangent and they clash. They're not synchronized. They're not in alignment and agreement. You cannot have unity. So now we know to pray for. Father, help me to remain in the sphere of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Help me to stay connected to God. Help me to stay connected to the disposition of God. You'll know that you are close to God when you start acting like it. Give me a foot real quick. That's a good preacher. Thank you, brother. You know that you're close to God and staying in God's sphere of prayer and presence when you start acting like God. You know when somebody's been with God because they just act just like their daddy. Jesus said, You'll know them by their fruits. When you hang around the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, guess what? Next thing you know, you start acting just like the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. What did I say? You hang around the five people that you hang around with, you'll become the sixth one. Amen. Amen. Hang around the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and you're going to think like them. Amen. You're going to reason like them. You're going to have their thoughts. And you'll start acting like the Father. Jesus said, I do nothing of my own. You see, there are no renegades that somebody help me. In the body of Christ, there are no renegades here. There are no Geronimos here out on their own. No, 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 no. That may be working okay in Western and Indian cowboy shoot them up movies, but not in the kingdom of God. There are no big shots and little shots in the kingdom of God. Nobody has a personal agenda they can bring to the table. No, sir. Our agenda is to do the will of him that sent us and called us to his, to his will. That's our agenda, period. I do always those things that are pleasing in his sight. And so what we need to pray for is to have that same goal, and that is to please God in all of our ways, to have the disposition of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. And so our objective is there, so that we may be in God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to be found in God and His Word in us, and you know that you are in God, and God is in you when you're living out the Word of God Amen. in your life. Let's talk about an objective again. Because I believe that this is one of the most important things to look at. Very, very important. You wouldn't think that reading this verse, you get all this stuff, right? Just if you just look at this verse, you wouldn't think, my God, where's all this coming from? But you see, with the scriptures, there's always so much in there in terms of meat around the bone. Some of us, uh, when we read the Word of God, we're looking at skeleton all the time. But if you put some meat on them bones, you'll, 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 you'll get a whole lot more. Now here, let me give you, let me give you an example as far as an objective is concerned. You remember I told you this about this a number of years ago. Uh, you look on your dollar bill, it says, e pluribusuna. That is in Latin that says, though many, we're one. Is that correct? It's on every dollar. It's in Latin. Yeah. And they got that from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, directly from the Bible. It says there, though we are many, we are one body. But now watch what he says, because we eat of the same loaf. 
We eat from the same bread. Let me give you that. In a more practical application, what happened uh, at 9-11? Was it 2001? 2001. What happened on 9-11? Everybody died. 3,000 people died. 3,300 people died. They, they crashed those planes and they you know, blew up their whole... Uh, those United Nations building out there. Twin Towers. Twin Towers. Now, on 9-10-01, we were in Pluribus, Illinois, in America. The day before, we were one in America. We were still the United States of America. But how many know that on political spheres, Although we are the United States of America, we are really the divided states of American culture. But something happened on 9-11 that changed the whole narrative of United States of America. Because on 9-12-2001, the whole demeanor changed in America. Amen. Politicians were coming out of the woodwork and they were saying, as of this day, we're no longer Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians. We are Americans today. Yes. Period. Not defined by political association. We're right. defined by the colors. And so, now there's an objective that united America. You getting this? You getting a picture of this? Something happened. See, you may disagree with your brother or sister, you know, especially when you were growing up. You got brothers and sisters, you know your siblings, and then boy, you can have a you can you can you can have a knockdown drag out with your sister or your brother. Then all of a sudden the neighbor across the street comes and beats up on your brother or sister. And guess who's going to be the first to stand between them to defend them? You, you're the one you just punched in the nose. Now you're ready to protect them. Amen. That's right. Amen. Absolutely. You see that? See how that happened? You know that we've seen like that here, not fist fight, but we've never had <laughs> it. Are you getting a picture? Watch now. Anybody that comes against your pastors, every one of you, Amen. every single one of you, let's say, all right now. And you would fill at this, you'd build a, a circle around your pastors and say the first one, cross that line. These pastors will preach your funeral and you'd be prepared to decide where, all right, and where you want to be buried because these pastors are our pastors. These brothers and sisters are our brothers and sisters. And we will protect and defend them. Don't come against people here at Calvary Community Church, either physically or verbally. You're not going to survive it here. That's right. If you don't like it here, get out. It's that simple. It's the same as the United States. If you don't like the U.S., get out. Find a, a country better than what you can have here. You won't find it. It's not there. It's just that you have an attitude. You love it, leave it. Love it or leave it. That's exactly right. Don't let your way go back where you came from. Come in, yes. And so here's, here's the point I'm telling you now. At 9-10... We were United States of America, but something happened on 9-11 that united us. So unity, watch now, unity needs an objective. Yes. That's right. Unity needs an objective. Unity needs a goal. And so now we see our goal is that we remain in God and God's word and Christ's spirit dwell in us. We must have that. We maintain that. And plus we must have a go. Because watch what the results are going to be. What's the last sentence? Everybody read that, the world, okay? Everybody read that together. That the world may believe that you sent me. Aha! Uh -huh. What's our goal? Yes, our unity. Yes, our unity. Now is a tool. Give God the tool. And he will draw people to the church. Amen. Is that right? Yes, sir. 
Because if now we have a goal, see. There's a reason why, not only because it pleases God, not only because we want God's favor and His smell of approval, but we want unity and unification of heart, mind, and spirit, aligning ourselves with one another, caring for one another, because our goal, our objective, is that God can use the display of oneness among us to draw the world to Jesus Christ. That's our objective. That's our goal. Are we learning anything tonight? Yes, we are. Now, with that, he's also given us an aid, a concurring aid, which I, I don't know if I doubt if I get to Romans 8, 26 tonight or 27. I, 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 I may not get there. I only got to verse 21 so far. All right, watch now. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. What is this thing again? What was that, Romans? No, don't go to Romans. No, I'm not going to give it to you. Because I don't want you to go there. Because I'm going to deal with it. If it's not tonight, it will be next week. I will not fail, I promise you. Okay. <laughs> Imagine a pastor doesn't want to give you a scripture. I'll see that. <laughs> Stay aligned with me, though. I have a reason for this. Anyway, so he's given us, watch now, he's given us a practical, watch now, he's given us now a practical tool to effectively give God the tool to draw people to himself. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Though we are many members, we are one body because we eat the same bread from the same loaf, and we drink from the same cup. Now, he gives us an actual physical tool. What am I doing here? 